All right. So today we're finally entering modernity, that period after the Enlightenment and before whatever we're in right now. But we like to call it modernity, 17th, 18th, 19th, early 20th century. You're filling up to date? Yeah, yeah, you should, because we spent the summer exploring the way of Jesus from a different perspective, a little more objective and scientific than orthodox. And today we are finally bidding the past adieu, well, at least the distant past. We're, we're going to begin to see what happens when the new thinking that we call the Enlightenment smashes up against Christianity's orthodox and ancient precepts. Sparks are going to fly, but we will eventually witness the birth of something new, something that we trace our own congregational roots back to, and that is the reformation of the church. The Protestant way is an interpretation of scripture that creates space for something new, differing opinions on the character and makeup of the divine one. Now, this is huge. Until the Reformation, speculation on God's being was considered something for the church and the clergy to work out and then tell you how to behave and how to be in the world. The Enlightenment and its attendant Reformation will rock the world because look out, here's coming the future. And as we know, the changes that are coming for all of our, our ancestors, well, it's going to be mind-blowing. Everything, everything is going to be reassessed and reformed. As Diana Butler Bass reminds us, since the Reformation, Protestants and Catholics have been reassessing Christian thought and practice in the modern world, trying to make sense of ancient ideas in a challenging new social, economic, and intellectual environment, those environments that were bubbling up in Europe and the Americas. And these big topics came up again and again. What is the meaning of life? And what is our place in this world? Now, those questions had been curated and the answers sustained by the Institutional Church, capital C. Ever since Constantine saw that image of the cross in a cloud of smoke in a dream that he had, the church had answers for you. All you had to do was trust and believe. Now, in fact, the church still has answers for you. It's just that those answers aren't as satisfying to accept anymore, at least not for me and probably for most of you. What the Enlightenment gave the world was space to pursue these questions as we each saw fit. We began to explore other ways to believe or not to believe, other ways of being in community and being in the world other ways to approach knowledge and science. We created space for different and differing and sometimes contradictory interpretations of scripture, where before, by design, there was only one interpretation and one accepted understanding of the Christ event. Christianity, or as I prefer, the way of Jesus, is now in modernity going to begin towards the quest for truth. And that's what modernity, when we talk about that period of time, is really concerned with. This idea of certainty, of truth, that things don't change. Now, there are plenty of people in your life, I'm, I'm assuming, I know they're in my life, who will say to you, why do you seek the way of Jesus when all of the work has already been done by the church? All you have to do is trust and believe and not worry about all of that other stuff. I don't know about you, but for me, there is an awful lot of unanswered and even misunderstood questions in all of that other stuff. I require a more holistic approach to the interpretation of Scripture. I require different lenses with which to see and know and learn from and celebrate the Christ event. 
I want to get as close as possible to understanding what Jesus wants for us, for God's children, even at the risk of offending the official church. Because that's what we're about. That's what Protestantism is about. We are protesting the established church and its understanding of God. And we've talked lots this summer about that unfinished Reformation. Because you see, remember what happened? All of the Protestants then began fighting because once you let the cat out of the bag, it's really difficult to get back in there. These universal truths that we seek an understanding of are not so easily uh, answered anymore. And sometimes the answer is unsettling. It disturbs us to understand that we are responsible for our poor neighbor. It disturbs us to hear that perhaps we don't know all we think we know. It disturbs us when some uppity person who doesn't know their place preaches to us to change. It really disturbs us, well, it really disturbs me when I listen closely to the ancient 8th eighth, eighth century Jewish sages who are calling us back into right relationship with the Holy One and with each other. It disturbs us, it even frightens us when our lives begin to change because of these disturbances. This early modern period was a time of intellectual, political, and social upheaval. It was a time of optimistic possibilities too. There, there was revolutionary change and economic possibilities and social visionaries believed they could solve all of the world's problems. Modern Christians from this period reworked this new theology. Now it's not centered on the supernatural aspects of the faith, but instead refocused on morality rather than doctrine. Modern Christians celebrated tolerance. They raise our awareness of the natural world that we share with all of God's creation. They reformed how we thought about this relationship between humans and the Holy One. The significant change that modernity is going to bring to the world is a quest for scientific and philosophical truth, certainty. And that quest will include a new way to look at the Jesus of history. What began here is a search for the historical Jesus, not the Christ as worshiped and taught by the church, but the simple Jewish man who offered a radical new way to be in the world. As Albert Schweitzer wrote in his landmark book, The Quest for the Historical Jesus, he wrote that early in the last century. If that gives you an idea how old some of us are. He wrote that in 1904. He wrote these words. He, Jesus, comes to us as one unknown, without a name, as of old, by the lakeside. Side. He came to those men who knew him not. He speaks to us the same words, follow thou me. And he sets us to the tasks which he has to fulfill in our time. He commands. And to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings which they shall pass through in his fellowship and as an ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience who he is. Schweitzer's book changed the world and if you don't believe me, strike up a conversation with Jim Radigan about this book. I don't know anyone who is a better Schweitzer scholar than that man. Many of you here have read the book, and it, and it shook you. It disrupted your beliefs. It forced you to set aside your embedded understanding of Jesus the Christ and begin to seek a better understanding of Jesus the man. Let's hear how Diana Butler Bass has described this in her book, A People's History of Christianity. So when Schweitzer's book appeared in 1906, English translation, it did seem to hit many Christians over the head. In it, Schweitzer argued that Jesus proclaimed the imminent 
kingdom of God, and that he had been sent to initiate God's messianic end times reign. Jesus' message was intrinsically knit into this context, a context of Jewish thought and culture that we can no longer understand. Thus, Jesus is a real person in history, but one whose contextual meaning cannot be recovered. Sidebar, I don't agree with that. Schweitzer separated the historical Jesus from the Christ of faith. He argued that the truth of Jesus cannot be found in history, but is rather found in the present experience of Christ as a living spiritual reality. Schweitzer's conclusion surprised many Christians, and that book, The Quest for the Historical Jesus, sparked controversy, as you can imagine, among all the theologians and churchgoers. It took a while for it to get traction, but it's a very popular book. We can find hints of the historical Jesus actually in the Bible itself. Uh, there's a verse from the eighth chapter of Mark where we get Jesus questioning this idea that he was the Messiah. Mark 20, uh, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. There's a lot of secrecy in Mark. Jesus, if you read Mark, look for all of the times that Jesus tells people, nope, this is secret stuff. Schweitzer goes on to tell us that many modern versions of Christianity deliberately ignore the urgency of the message that Jesus proclaimed. Each new generation hopes to be the one to see the world destroyed, another world come along, and the saints governing over a new earth. So Schweitzer concludes that that first century theology originating in those early lifetimes of those men and women who followed Jesus first, that that theology is both incompatible and very different from the beliefs later made official by the Roman Emperor Constantine in AD 325. Schweitzer, even in that brief two or three centuries, saw an amazing shift from this, the teachings of Jesus to the teachings of the church. So Schweitzer has forced us to look at the Christ event through this new lens. We've got to refocus our vision, try to see what he was getting at. And that is this. There is more to our Christian belief than what the church was teaching. We can now come at the Christ story on our own without doctrine, without dogma, without fear. We have a more modern counterpart of this in the Jesus Seminar that I know everyone here is pretty familiar with. They have one that travels on the road, and we partnered with Plymouth a few years, and we had the Jesus Seminar here in Wichita. The Jesus Seminar was founded by Robert Funk in 1985 to continue the work that Schweitzer and others had begun. They wanted to find proof of the historical Jesus. So what the Jesus Seminar discovered about the historical Jesus is very different than the one we just heard described by Albert Schweitzer. The seminar's understanding of the historical Jesus portrays him as an itinerant Hellenistic Jewish sage and faith healer who preached a gospel of liberation from injustice using his famous and startling parables and sayings. They found him to be an, an iconoclast, breaking the well-established Jewish theological dogmas and social conventions in both his teachings and his actions, often by turning common sense ideas upside down, confounding the expectations of his audience. He preached of heaven's imperial rule, traditionally translated as kingdom of God as being already present but unseen. He depicts God as a loving father. 
Jesus fraternizes with outsiders and criticizes insiders. Also, according to the Jesus Seminar, Jesus was a mortal man born of two human parents who did not perform miracles, nor did he die as a substitute for sinners, nor did he rise bodily from the dead. The sightings of a risen Jesus represented the wild visionary experiences of some of his disciples rather than actual physical encounters. There's a lot of heresy in that sentence, isn't there? <laughs> and I love heresy, so... While these claims have been repeatedly made in various forms since the 18th century, what was unique about the Jesus Seminar was how they went about it. Their research methodology was groundbreaking. Each member of the seminar had to give clear reasons as to why they had come to their understanding of a specific passage. And then the entire seminar would vote using a system of colored beads. It's fascinating. I suggest you look up how they did it and what all the colored beads mean. But what they ended up with is what these scholars, these experts in all of these documents believe are the actual words of the historical man called Jesus of Nazareth. This past week, I had to help lay to rest a 31-year-old man who died recently under very tragic circumstances. And as you can imagine, the family is broken and adrift, clinging to each other as they try to make sense of something that there is no sense to be made from. And I ask for your prayers for this family. When you work with people in their grief, you often learn that we don't think about life and death and theology and, the and philosophy all that much. We, we generally think about these things at those significant mileposts of life. Childbirth, illness, death, achievement of a, of a life goal. It is at those times that human thought turns to God. And if we're being honest with ourselves, we have the same big questions that are almost identical to the big questions we asked in our youth. Who am I? What is my purpose in this world? What is all of this about? What gives my journey meaning? It appears that Christianity is a, is a quest, a quest for truth and a journey. It's a way to be in the world. It's a way to move through our lives, through this thick life, to paraphrase a young poet that I once was. And if we use some of the other metaphors that I've hopefully illuminated for you this summer, that quest we are on is often seen as a return to Eden. We're trying to get back to God. If, as I believe, our spirits come from God upon our births, as in the ancient Jewish belief that each of us has a tiny fragment of God deep within us, then if that's true, then it follows that our spirit would yearn to return to God, which it does upon our death. I find great solace in that thought. And for me, it explains my spirit's response to God's presence. Our God fragment knows when it is in the presence of another God fragment or the Holy One, and it fills us with these powerful, profound feelings of connection. That's why we belong to a church. That's why we belong to this church, because we recognize that God is in every human on the planet. And how we care for those humans is a direct reflection of how we care for God, God's world, and each other. Every week I always ask you some questions, so here you go. How are you going to show the world God's presence in your life? How are you going to live the way of Jesus in the coming week? How are you going to interpret that gospel message of love and salvation for all and reconcile that with what happens out there? How will you be a life-giving Christian in the world today? I have a feeling that you will do it with the knowledge that perhaps your purpose in life is to be fully present wherever the Holy One puts you to do the work that we all know needs to be done. 
Maybe you have found the meaning of your life. Perhaps you are supposed to be God's hands in this world. And that's more than enough meaning for me to get to show the world how much I love God and you and neighbor. That would be a fine epitaph for any of us. Amen.